and Jim's group has done that for us. They started us off in that direction. What we were not able to provide in the last survey in 2010 and 11 was a statistical analysis that Jim's Synergy Solution has been able to provide, and I'll, I think he's going to explain it to you. I've never seen statistics dumbed down this well, so that everyone will understand it. I, I'll have to compliment Jim on that. Um, and it pre the statistical analysis that he is able to do is able to show us how to drill down and look at the data from different perspectives, and he'll go over that. All of it is also, the reason we chose Synergy Solutions was because we interviewed several groups outside of the area, and they were the most reasonably priced, but also the most well-versed in what's going on in our Southwest Florida community because they reside here. They are able to compare our information with other clubs and make conclusions that actually enhance what they're able to tell us. So I think that's another advantage to having a professional survey, but particularly done by Synergy Solutions. So when the board, I mean, when the Strategic Planning Committee said to me in 2013, I was the chair, that they wanted to go outside and get a professionally done survey, I said, I know we don't have it in the budget, and the board is going to push back. But they did their homework. They, the committee was terrific. They interviewed other groups, and they selected Synergy Solutions for all of the reasons that I've just mentioned. Um, I will mention that Jim is also a professional, like a lot of us, who has retired and made a second career out of this, from what I've gathered. He has connections at all the clubs down here. He also has told me in the course of working with him for two years that he, he used to be a club president. So he understands the issues that a board faces and he is able to address bringing those, some of his recommendations to us from a very good perspective. The last thing I will mention, uh, no, two more things. One is that there's a woman behind the scenes who is not able to be here, Dr. Aisha Gold-Timor, who is also the dean of the School of Business at Hodges. And she was the statistician who did all of the legwork or the, the analyses, regression analyses behind the scenes. A, a remarkable woman, and um, I'm sorry she couldn't be here to see us thank her, too. Um, but lastly, I would just say that yesterday the Strategic Planning Committee was gracious enough to invite Tim and me to come in and hear a preview of the information. That was less than 24 hours ago, and I want everybody to understand right from the start that you will be hearing this information, and it's such an incredible presentation. You will want to hear it again or review the documentation that comes out afterwards and see the videotape that will be done. And and that's where we are right now. We have not been exposed to this information for more than 24 hours. What the next steps will be is that, that we will ask all of the committees to take a look at the data that comes in through their committee and see if there are areas that they may want more information, to ask more questions, and then we'll work with um, Tim, who will be trained on how to do some of these analyses. But Jim has offered to work with us and getting more information that will help us prioritize what, what we need to do next as next steps. So we have not come up with a game plan yet, other than to say that Tim has already got his staff on alert. We know in general what we expected to see in the survey results. They are all starting to prepare action plans already. So I know that just so you know ahead of time that that's where we are in the process. And with um, this is a very brief introduction. Let me just say thank you, Jim, for coming over and for walking us through this data, which is incredibly com complex. How's this for sound? Just expanding a little bit uh, on what Marie said. I've been retired from the chemical industry for uh, 23 years, and was president of Bear Small Country Club in 2004, 5, and 6. We decided to improve the quality of the offerings uh, that we had, the amenities, the products, and services. And from work I had done in the chemical industry over the years, I knew it should be possible to both measure satisfaction and simultaneously determine whether that item was an important <coughs> item influential item or a trivial <laughs> item. For example, if we ran a survey and we asked, how satisfied are you with food quality? And 
how satisfied are you with the music we play on the player piano? And they both got a low score, and we only had enough money to work on one of them. Which one should we work on? It turns out it is possible to calculate that. You don't have to intuitively guess at it. It is possible. And that's where Dr. Eichigold teamwork came in back in 2004. I paid her, we did it for uh, Bear's Paw. And um, after a while, we said, you know, nobody in the United States does this. We ought to do this because it's the correct and appropriate way to do surveys. That's how we got in business. We now do surveys in the two county area. Uh, we did seven this year. We typically do three to, to seven clubs just like this. Let's start with some definitions. Is the sound okay? Can you hear it okay? Uh, the goals of, of uh, this survey are to tell what the good news was, the complimentary things, and then to identify those shortcomings which you can improve in the future. I will use the word you frequently, and I, I definitely do not mean you as an individual. I usually don't even mean you who responded to the survey. I mean you who are members of this club. So when I say you, I'm talking about the entire population of the club. I will use the term on the next survey, and that does not mean that I'm trying to get another survey. Uh, it's possible to do what the Good Samaritan did, which is to see a problem, take corrective action, and walk off and never come back to see if anything happened good about it. It's more common to run a survey downstream after you've done some of these actions to find out if any of them were effective or not. This is your story. These are your data. I am simply the messenger. I'm taking photographs of your good side and your bad side, and I'm telling you what the photograph looks like, but it's a photograph of you, not me. You need to recognize that this is the end. Today is the end of the investigation period. We ran a survey, you told us. Today is the beginning of the <coughs> restoration period, fixing things up that are not correct. And you are a part of that, along with the leadership of the club. I will show you today much less than half of what can be got from this survey. There were 125,000 bits of data, 2,500 individual comments on about 150 subjects, and your picture will be from the top down, the big picture. At the committee level, when they're trying to figure out what to do about things and why this happened and who did it, and why people vote this way, that will be the other half of the survey, the drilling down half of the survey. And that comes later in the months that follow. But there's a lot more available from this survey than I will show you today. Every club has its own vision and mission, but all clubs have the same goal, and that is to ensure that they are meeting the owner's expectations. That is question number one on all of our surveys. Overall, how satisfied are you that this club is meeting your expectations? Why did you buy here? What did you think you would get here? Are you happy here? Do you have some suggestions that might improve what there is here? Now, you can run all kinds of surveys. The lowest level one is the focus group where you say things like, would you like a larger martini? And everybody says, I would. <laughs> and then they, they buy glassware, and they serve you one, and you say, good grief, nobody said it was $11. <laughs> we don't have any futuristic questions. It is possible to ask futuristic questions. But you've got to say, here's what we've done up to this point. Here are the benefits. Here's the likelihood we could ever carry it off. Here's what it will cost you to get into it. Here's what it will cost you every year to run it. And here are the three options you have for paying for it. If you're willing to do that, then you can ask a question about the future. And you will get an answer back that will be accurate enough to predict whether the membership will actually approve it 
when they hear the $11 part. But unless you do that, when you come up with the $11, you'll get rejected. And the far extreme is a highly technical survey, and that's what this is today. We get two answers to each question. Nobody else that we know of in, in the world doing survey work does this. We use techniques that are used a thousand times a day in the world of government, commerce. Nobody uses it for surveys except us. One, one answer is the satisfaction score you gave us. The other answer we calculate. This is not a census, it's a survey. A census is when you send out a um, questionnaire like the monthly bill and everybody sends one back. A survey is when you send out an invitation and some people respond and some do not. In this case, we got 732 responses out of what we calculate to be 1,522 possible people. That allows for singles. And that's a 48% response rate, which the man on the street says uh, that's not very good. More than half the people did not respond to the survey. How can we believe anything about the survey? But it's well within the requirements of the statistician. That number allows me to say that I am 99% confident that any number you see today will not be more than 3.4% from the true number. Now, what is the true number? It's the number on that question we would have got if we had all 1,572 people in the room and they all answered it. That's the true value for that question. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me show you. An average is not a, a thing with size. It's a point. Let's say I ask a question on a survey. <clears throat> How satisfied are you with the menu in the grill? And back comes your answer. 732 people. I get the average. It's 415, excuse me, 4.15 on a scale of 1 to 5, where 1 is terrible greatly fails to meet expectations, and five is great, exceeds expectations, 4.15. And here's the point, has no dimensions at all. 3.4% is somewhere between 4.01 and 4.29, and if I give you the size of that on the, on the charts that I will be using today, this is what it is. The left uh, side of that little rectangle is 4.01, the right side is 4.29, and I will be using these balls, and that's the typical size of a ball. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is any ball you see today will be centered on the response average. <coughs> and somewhere underneath that ball is the true average. For all practical purposes, you will be looking at what all 1,522 people believe about that issue. There are two things that come from a survey quantitative data and qualitative data. And the qualitative data are the comments. Now, don't try to read this. I'm just showing as an example. This uh, is how it will show. We had 2,497 of them in the bottom there. The last comment I have is from a person number 182. It had to do with leadership. These will now be broken down, and each department will get a printout of the comments for that department, each, each department, each committee. Um, I will give training to Tim and his staff on how to make quick queries of that database of 2,500. And if somebody asks the question, tell me everything people said about dues, Tim will be able to do a report for you in less than one minute on the subject of dues. If you say, well, I meant dogs, and I think maybe that will happen. <laughs> we can do another report in one minute on what everybody said on dogs. It's a true database, and you can ask any question about any word that anybody said and get a report very quickly. What we'll be doing is searching for the root cause of the problem. And we'll do a lot of that today, and it will be what's influencing that cause. Then we will a little bit today, overlay it with the demographics of the population here, explaining who was it that voted that way. And we will do very little with the bottom, which is 
Now, why did they do that? And that comes from the comments. But this is the process you go through if you would like to answer a question that has a low score. What, what was it that caused that low score? What component of our population, maybe it's just everybody, usually it's a component of our population that scores it that way. And why did they score it that way? What did they say about why they scored it that way? So that's the process. From now on, there are no more words. Everything is on this chart. So if you don't understand this chart at the end of it, you're going to be in big trouble because all the data will come just like this, chart after chart after chart. It's called a quadrant chart. We devised it for the purpose, and it has a title. We're going to put these balls, like the <clears throat> grill menu, on this chart. Each of the balls is going to be a subordinate unit to the title. And the title at the moment is, overall, how satisfied are you that this club meets your expectations? It's the name of the, of the chart at the moment. It will change. We have two scales here. The satisfaction on the X scale or the horizontal scale, and it goes from left to right, gaining, growing as you go right, and influence as it goes from the bottom to the top, gaining as you go toward the top. The true values here are three over here. If everybody answered the question with a three, nobody had a two or a four, the ball would sit here. If everybody answered the question with a five, the ball would sit over there, and obviously the midline is a four. Why don't we have one to five since that's how they answered the question? Because when you get 700 responses, it's never an average below three. If it is, there's a mutiny on campus. It's just, <laughs> they would never work around state. So it's always between three and five. We spread it out so you can see the differences. In the balls. From now on, I will rarely talk about three, four, and five, and I will talk about the relative relationship of low satisfaction or high satisfaction, low influence or high influence. <clears throat> so here's our friend, the grill menu. We ran the survey, it was a two question survey. Question one overall, how satisfied are you that this club is meeting your expectations? And the second question was, how satisfied are you with the menu and grill? That's the end of the survey. And here's the result. What does that tell us? It tells us that people are satisfied with the menu and the grill, and it's quite influential when they consider whether or not you're meeting their expectations. Now, the influence part doesn't attach to grill. It attaches to the title. And this is the hard part for you to conceive. If you don't get this, you're going to be in trouble for the next 40 minutes. Let's say that it, oh, by the way, this is its position on satisfaction, which is pretty good, and that's its position on influence. Let's say, however, it came back like this. What would we say about the results of the survey? Well, we would say that grill menu is quite satisfying to the people. In fact, it's just as satisfying as the other guy who got the survey with it up in A. However, it doesn't appear to be much of an influence on whether or not the club is meeting people's expectations. They must be expecting something other than the grill menu. They must be making that decision on something other than the grill menu. Let's say it's over here. Well, what about this? We ought to fix it. There's something wrong with it. You ought to fix it. But even if you fix it and you run another survey, don't expect that the score will be higher on overall or you meet as a club meeting your expectations. Why? Grill menu just doesn't have much of an influence on what you think about when somebody asks you, is this club meeting your expectations? Now, the board controls this axis. Everything I show you today can be moved from the left to the right by a board action every single day. The board action required to do that may be counterproductive. Pace of play. Pace of play is not a problem. If it's low now at 8 minutes, raise it to 11 minutes. 
You'll have no more problems with pace of play. Now, you can't get 25% of the people on the course that day. And that's another problem. But you need to know, because of the need to understand the vertical part, you need to know that this is controlled by the board if they choose to do it. That is not. Nobody has any control over this. This is simply what is in the mind of you people when we ask that question up there. Overall, how well is this club meeting your expectations? And for some of you, it will be a grill. For some of you, it will be a pool. You know, it just depends upon what the population believes is important to that subject or not. Now you've got the ones in the D area. These are not very satisfying, and they are quite influential on whether people think you're meeting their expectations. So why do we need to know this vertical one? Well, it's back to the uh, uh, player piano music. You're going to have a series of balls here, and you may have to make choices about which one to work on. If, and only if, your goal is to improve the title. If that's your goal, then the biggest bang comes from things in quadrant B. It will be a bigger bang than you get from quadrant C, but you still need to fix the stuff in quadrant C. If that's not your goal, if you don't care about that, then we don't even need the vertical axis. Here's the response by neighborhood. The big uh, turn in number of people. These are responses, by the way. The big turnout was from Brayburn uh, and then Thornbrook. The smallest was from uh, Shoreham, uh, Manchester. Here it is on a percentage basis. 60% uh, uh, from Thornbrook and half that percentage from uh, Carrington. However, Carrington sent their happiest people. <laughs> <laughs> and they scored higher than anybody else. This is, this is the uh, score that the question, overall, how satisfied are you that this club is meeting your expectations? It was 4.11 on a scale of 1.5. That's a pretty good score. That means that the people here are, are willing to give us a pretty high score. It would take a lot of force and bias to get, to overwhelm some people who must be voting one and two and get the average up that high. Uh, and then this would be one-tenth higher that on this line, this person here, Manchester, they voted 4.21. So what is it about Shoreham? I don't have the foggiest. <laughs> I could not. But it is far enough from the norm that there is something about Shoreham. They voted enough different from the norm on the overall question, how happy are you that you're here, that they have a reason for it. You may choose to research that reason, you may choose to ignore it, but this is big enough to show that there's something there that I know nothing about. Show you one more slide and then we'll get to your notes. Normally what you have here is a long-term continuing checkpoint of whether or not you're getting any results. I'm showing you here the 2008 uh, food and beverage uh, chart from Bears Paw Country Club. These are the results in 2008. We were very disappointed with menu variety, with food quality. The wine list uh, wasn't as high as we thought it should be. The dining facilities, <laughs> nobody cared about them. And we had one here which was really interesting. The question was, when you enter the dining room, how satisfied are you that the wait staff recognizes who you are? Uh, we were quite pleased that it had high satisfaction. We couldn't figure out why it had high importance, uh, high influence on overall food and beverage. So we interviewed some people. It turned out that we had hired some new wait staff, and not everybody was sure that these wait staff people would know who they were when they came in. Here's what we did. We fired the chef. We hired a new chef. We got the people who were 
complaining about the wine list, we put on a wine committee and we took our food and beverage person and sent them to Napa Valley for a week. <laughs> said, learn about wines. We bought a wine cooler. We went to uh, Jonas, the uh, point of order system, and we found a way to put our photographs on there. So that when the wait person went to see who was at table 17, here's old MacArthur and his wife, you know, and they come up and say, glad to have you here tonight, MacArthur. And here's what happened in the next survey. <coughs> Quality improved a lot. Menu variety improved a lot. Wine list improved. Satisfaction improved with wine list. There was no change in uh, the recognized me to speak of, and dining facilities, a little bit of change. That's a satisfaction component from year to year. Here's the importance, influence component. Menu variety was an important factor. It is still an important factor. Food quality the same. Dining jumps to the top. It's now an important factor. Why? Because you don't have to worry about food quality and menu. It now rises to be the equal of other important things. And, uh, Wine list became less controversial, and nobody worried about being recognized. <laughs> <laughs> now, because I'm only going to show you this first year, I wanted to show you how this goes. And it can be, as you see, very dramatic on the, on the vertical scale, much less so on the horizontal scale. So with all that as background, here are the results of your survey. <laughs> Let's start up here in the A quadrant. <clears throat> the people at this club believe quite strongly that they are getting extraordinary value when they bought in here. And that's important to them. They think golf is very satisfying, and the golf course is fine, very satisfying. And tennis, by the way, the tennis ball is small because the diameter of the ball is a function of the number of people who responded to that question. Uh, golf or tennis? Security, no problem. You know, this is a four, remember. <clears throat> fitness, uh, we'll see that there, there are a couple of small problems in fitness, but the real problem areas are food and beverage, leadership, and administration. Those score low, and uh, they are important. On the next slide, which is going to be the uh, golf program, I'm going to show you the highest scoring thing in this entire survey, which was the outside staff at the pro shop. <laughs> that's where that ball comes, and this is the score it gets. Now let's just, for the sake of argument, bring down food and beverage and show where it is. Let me ask you a question. Do you think, show of hands here, do you think that Stonebridge, the membership at Stonebridge, gives a higher score to this issue outside Pro Shop than Gray Oaks does? Let me see. Who thinks that you do? Show of hands. Okay. Same question over here. How many believe that Stonebridge gives a higher score to overall food and beverage than Gray Oaks. <clears throat> Here's the answer. Who cares? <laughs> there, are, there are things in the world where you need to benchmark yourself against the outside world, and I will show you some, because you need to know where you stand. You need to know, for example, how much to pay the head golf professional. Uh, what's a reasonable number for the food uh, <coughs> ingredient cost? But when it comes to satisfaction, Gray Oaks has nothing to say about this. This is what we need to know. This membership is willing, under certain conditions, to give an extremely high score if they're satisfied. And there is. No reason they wouldn't do it for food and beverage if it were as good. 
it is simply not as satisfying <coughs> to this population at this point in time. So what is the goal of this club? It's to move all these balls as far as you can to the right without introducing even bigger problems like 25% of the people can't play if you change the pace of play. Now, I'm going to go through every one of these balls individually and show you why they are at the position that they are. Let's start with the golf program. Here's this outside stats, the highest score on the thing. <clears throat> Let's start by looking at Rangers, Chelsea, and Pace of Play. They are in exactly the same position they would be at Bears Paw or Grey Oaks. These things, it's like saying, listen, did I charge you enough for that? You know, the answer is no. You charge me too much. Yes, it should be lower. It's one of those things that always is going to be too slow. The Chelsea system at a club like this is going to be chipping me out of rounds of golf. And the Rangers, because this is not a municipal course, the board is unable to give the Rangers the power that you would like to see them have so that they would score way out here. They're always there. So let's forget those. Clothing and merchandise, yes, they, they are in this area in most clubs, but that's no excuse. This is an area that the golf committee needs to take a look at. You need better ordering, you need better inventory control uh, in that area, according to you. Look at the rest of these things. The staff and the way the tournament's men's uh, 18 hole, ladies 18 hole, these are fine. They get high scores, you have nothing at all wrong with the golf program. It's highly regarded, and the people are highly regarded. Let's take a look at the course. Same kind of thing. With the exception of practice facilities, all high scores. Not much difference between greens, fairways, and tees, cart paths, bunkers, drainage. Uh, very high scores on the, on the appearance of the grounds and the appearance of the landscaping. That's good. It is a beautiful place. It is really a spectacular place, and this building is really outstanding. I know that not all of you voted in favor of this building at the time. Uh, years ago, when the idea of building the overpass on the uh, airport came up, I was selected to give 20-some public speeches against it, which I did. And um, I lost. They built the overpass in spite of the fact that I said you should build now people come to me and say, boy, thanks, Jim, for getting as nice an overpass as we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, <John Dutton> said, <coughs> we also serve who only stand and wait. So each of us has a destiny. And even those of you who complained about this thing, you've got a magnificent edifice now that you can be proud of. No, of course, no problems at all. Practice facilities, remember the uh, practice facilities were the only one that was a little low. So now we drill down, we make this the dependent variable, and we ask these independent variables, how do you affect that? And the only thing that we see is there's some negativism toward the short game. You apparently don't have much of a short game place here. If there's an opportunity, a physical opportunity to, to improve it, that's probably what that committee should be looking for. Security, no problem whatsoever. Good comments, <coughs> like the people, no problem. Fitness program, well, the place is clean. <laughs> <laughs> Even like the cardio and the pull and spa, the strength isn't cut off. People don't understand, really. They claim they don't understand as much as they ought to know to be using this equipment. So here's something to focus on. You know, have some, some training down in there when people are down there. Uh, classes, not so many people take classes, as you can see from the size of the ball. But I would look into that. There's something, and, and the comments will tell you, there's something there that could be done better by, by the classes. No big problem. <coughs> here's an interesting one. Value. We ask a question that everybody hates, which is, how would you define value? Would you say that you would define it by the price you pay for what you get? Or would you say that you define it by how the worth compares with your expectation of what you thought you were going to get? Shall I 
tell you in a minute how that question breaks down in this club, and it's substantially different than it is in the club I just left yesterday. Value. <clears throat> the golf course has very high value. You say to yourselves, we got a great course here, it's well maintained, um, it's going to be here in great shape a long time, people come here because of that, that's a great value. The program has high value, security has high value, and here's a really interesting one that you don't often see. And look at the size of that ball. What that says is a lot more people than tennis players voted very high that you have a tennis program at this club. That is not normal. That is not at all normal. Normally, only the tennis people vote that it has value, and the people paying for it that don't play tennis wish they didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> what is, what's this mean? It's indicative of a forward-looking membership. Tennis is important, perhaps, to the young guy coming in, and you see that, and you say, we need this in spite of the fact I don't play it. Very good sign. Uh, all this other stuff right on, the, right on the line, no problem. Food and beverage, perceived to be a lower value than anything else, relatively speaking. Okay, here's how you answer that price versus expectations. Two out of three of you said, I base my judgment using both, but if you force me to say it, on expectations. So well, what's that mean? It means that this is probably a more worldly audience than I sometimes encounter. The place I just left, the blue was four times larger than the red. Very price-oriented. Uh, I would expect if I were on the board, there would be substantial difficulty in introducing a new amenity upgrade. <coughs> Here, you've been around clubs uh, around the world enough that you apparently uh, stand in judgment based upon what you expect from an operation like this. <clears throat> Leadership. Well, here is that question for the clubs that I have surveyed, that Chico and I have surveyed in the two county area. The score is not high, but neither is it high than any other club, you know. They, they're damned from the time they volunteered at two. <laughs> <laughs> by the people who don't volunteer. <laughs> so, let's start by saying that your leaders are not far off the mark, whatever that's worth. They're not far off the mark. You find the same thing at Bears, Paul, Pelicans, Sound, all around. Here are the components of leadership. First of all, people are comfortable that you have planned, that the financial plan going forward is a good one. It, they understand it. It looks solid. They're not concerned about it. It is an important factor, by the way. <coughs> but they're not concerned. They're happy with it. Um, to a greater degree than they, than they understand the strategic plan itself, this needs to be communicated better, the, the long-range plan, what you're going to do I don't know if you have a uh, master site plan or not for continued build out, but that needs to be communicated if you do have one. If you don't have one, you probably should have one. Master site plans keep people from coming up with these harebrained individual ideas <laughs> that just stack on top of each other. And then you hire a guy to come in and do a focus group, and they say, yes, I would like a larger martini. And you're in trouble. Master site plans are not going to happen. Uh, the general manager, uh, stacks up better on communicating to the people and listening from the people than the board does. The board gets low marks on listening to people or communicating back to people. And uh, if we believe what Marie said this morning, maybe we're, we're on a new step forward on that issue. The yellow ball was the overall, how satisfied are you with the board? That's the yellow ball. So these are areas that you are addressing right now. <coughs> we have town halls. Any 
going to address them. These are the comments on leadership. Now, I haven't gone into uh, the comments to dig out very many. Uh, I didn't do it on golf and so on. They're, they tend to be good. But I have where things are not good. And here are the comments. These comments were on communications from the board and the general manager to uh, the people. This area has three groups in it. Uh, I'm concerned about the planning. I'm not sure that you're planning adequately for the future. You let go three people or two people, and you didn't tell me anything about it. I don't understand it. The people like me. I like the people. I don't like that. I wish you hadn't done it. Somebody tell me next time you're going to do it. This whole area of some people let go without appropriate explanation of why. I'm not represented. The board consists of all people in uh, villas, not condos, or something like that. You know, I am not represented by the board. Those three comments are all in there, probably 50 or 60 comments. Kudos. Every, everything's great. Thanks. You're the greatest people in the world. The leaders are doing great. All the kudos. Critical. You're not great. <laughs> and you're specifically. It's where you've screwed up. <laughs> but here's one I've never seen. <laughs> there is a groundswell of uh, hope that things are about to really turn good for this club. I've never seen it. And the general manager. The leadership comments are heavily about the general manager, and they're about half good and about half bad. The good ones are that apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently when you were building this building, uh, not everything went perfectly. And at some point, when it was at its lowest, Tim stepped in, and the, the members believe that what he did brought it home like it looks. In or out of budget, I don't know. But Tim is given credit for a major part of closure on what apparently was a bad deal at the time. The thing he does bad, and this is really interesting because he only does one thing bad, <laughs> as far as you can tell, is he's not around. I used to see him before his general manager, and now I don't see him. I think he could improve. Ten points if he simply stopped working and walked. <laughs> 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 <It's a, laughs> I said we were fortune consulting and simply saying that it applies to you. He, he actually is well liked. Um, it's just that he maybe because of what's been going on, but I think tomorrow he'll be out there hustling. <laughs> Administration. Now, this is a, this is one we never see. This is the worst score we we've, we've ever got on administration. I didn't put all of the things in, but it's not emails, it's not voice, and it's not website. They all fall right about where you do. And it's billing. The here is reception and office staff would normally be out here with the outside guy at the pro shop. I mean, that's who everybody sees. They fall in love with them like a grandchild in the home and they score them really high. That's a problem. So here are the administration comments. The blue is kudos. Everything's fine administration. Uh, the red is comments pro or con about the communication the vehicles. The green is general manager comments that are all strong positive comments. And the uh, rest of it is staff concerns. <coughs> Point up there is uh, miscellaneous comments. And of the staff concerns, back comes this lost staff. You let people go and you didn't tell me about it. Reception and uh, reservations by itself is a problem. And here's the, here's the recommendation that you all give to fix things up. These people have got to be trained. They're simply not trained. All right, here we go with food and beverage. <clears throat> with one exception, <coughs> this is the lowest score we've ever got in a survey. Uh, overall, how satisfied are you with food and beverage? 
So let's find out why that is and what can be done. Here's the food and beverage, uh, the components that make up food and beverage. We see, let's start with the bistro. The bistro has, is satisfying. People like the bistro. We'll find out why in a minute. Uh, the bar staff is fine. The grill room is not bad. <coughs> let's forget about entertainment, Sunday buffet, and uh, the event menu for a minute. And let's focus on these. These are people issues. The reservation system appears to be broken. The people don't really, under the wait staff, don't understand uh, the order. They don't understand the wine <coughs> list. They don't come out looking like they should. They don't wear the name tags. They look sloppy. And in the main dining room, <coughs> we'll take a look at that now. In the main dining room, we see those characteristics over again very bad timeliness between the time you sit down, give the order, and you actually get served. Very low. It is not a social magnet. People don't like to go there to meet with other people. The quality is low. The menu variety is low. The hours, forget the hours, you know, the board decides that. Dress code, not so bad for, for a um, semi-formal place uh, compared to what we'll see in the bistro. Um, presentation probably as good as it was on the other slide. <coughs> Timeliness is the issue here. It is a really a low score, probably lower than any score I've shown you so far. So let's take a look at why that is. We haven't delved into it completely yet, but I just wanted to show you how we do this kind of thing. This is a low score, 3.15. Everybody complains about timeliness. But all ages of women, in red, complain about it more than the men. <laughs> That's perhaps understandable. After I've had two martinis, I don't know why we can't. <laughs> I didn't go there. I didn't go there. The, <laughs> the, joke, the, old, the two old guys are sitting in the living room talking and their wives are making uh, dinner. One guy says to the other, you know, we had the greatest meal last night downtown in Naples, one of the best I ever had. The guy said, where was it? He said, what, what is the name of that flower that you give to somebody you love? Give a dozen of them. The guy said, Rose. Rose, what was the name? <laughs> again, very poor. <clears throat> the two menus are judged to be poor. And finally, the bistro. It is a social magnet. People do like to go there to meet friends. Timeliness, once again, is poor. It's kind of surprising because it must be a different kind of service uh, relationship, but maybe not. <coughs> um, at the turn, I don't know. I didn't delve into this. At the turn, maybe it should be a little higher. Is that run by the bistro? Anyway, it, this will give you some things to drill down, investigate a little further, see what the golfers say about at the turn. They'll tell you why it's scoring lower. All right, here are the comments. There were 443 comments about food and beverage. 11% of them had to do with menu. 11% with quality. 38% poor service. 14% of the people said everything's great. 7% said it's improving. and. 5% said, well, it's okay. Here's why people eat off campus. This is interesting. Blue is menu. I'm sorry. Over there is menu. This is <coughs> well, when you live in Naples, Florida, you've got to expect that people are going to go downtown for atmosphere. You can't stop them. But the interesting part of this is this here. <coughs> interesting part of this is uh, the red and green. They are not going downtown because their pricing is inappropriate. The 
because they can get better value. And that is the main reason we have a lot of fun. And even more surprising, they are not going downtown because the service has got bad enough yet. <laughs> Those are two very powerful points. Expand upon them here in a second, right here. This is an interesting slide, which I haven't seen before. The blue is how many times do you eat lunch at the club per week in season? And how many times do you eat lunch out per week in season? Look over here at, at zero. There are, these are respondents, there are 54 respondents who never eat at the club. There are another 54 who almost never eat at the club. This is an amazingly low number. I've never seen a number that low. Usually, the people that don't eat at the club would be this height here. Here's dinner, same thing. The people who don't eat at the club are a relatively small component of the population. And a relatively large component of the population are eating one or two meals a week at the club. Now they're eating downtown too, but they are eating at the club. And they're doing it when there's a serious problem with food and beverage. So here's what we've got. We've got 2,750 meals being eaten off campus in season each week by the membership. That's 1.6 times the numbers that they're eating at the club. Most of the surveys we do, that number is three times to five times larger. This is a surprising result. More people, in spite of a low score, continue to eat here yet <laughs> than we would expect. Age of the people. Uh, unfortunately, when you ask this question, you have to give a little bracket of five years. And these are the five-year brackets. <laughs> and because it's a bracket, we don't know for sure what the average is. But the average is 70, plus or minus probably a year and a half. And that would be in the red band here. Now, that's a good spread. That's a, that's a nice-looking uh, spread of ages. If you now take that and put it on a graph for the next 20 years, if you sell 38 sales per year to 76 new people with the current population you have, and the current age is 70, and those people coming in is 58, which it has been, in 20 years, you'll be the same age as you are now. And you will never have reached 72 years of age. That is, that is an oxymoron. That is a young club. In this world, that is a young club. That's not Bear's club. It's more of a spot today than it was four years ago. But uh, as a young club, you are very fortunate. And last 12 months, you sold 40. So if you stay right on that line, you will be a young club. Why do people join clubs in the first place? Well, they join them for the same reason they join the Marine Corps. They look inside, they see people that they would like to be like. They say, I think I could be join that organization. If this club is of people under age 72, you will get younger people in here. And younger people just quit working, they have a lot more money than older people. Okay, we ask a question uh, at the end. Please rate your interest in potentially available social activities where five is very interested in one is I, I would never use it. Here were the were the things that we gave. Uh, bocce is a clear winner, followed by pickleball. You cannot believe the activity in clubs about pickleball and bocce. Bocce is a little bit uh, more established, but pickleball is really coming up. But I would say that people who apparently would actually participate, uh, quite a few of them, would if you had bocce. <clears throat> All right, let's recap now what we learned that's positive. <coughs> this is a beautiful place with forward-looking 
owner members. And they're forward looking because of things like tennis and because of the score you get on the financial projections. That's forward looking. Stone Bridge delivers value to its owner members. The course is perceived as a valuable asset, it's well maintained and managed in the golf program, it is strong and the employees are highly regarded. There are no problems with security. Tennis is a valuable amenity by far more people than those who play. And compared to other clubs, leadership scores are normal, but this membership expresses a rather unique feeling of expectation and desire for good things to happen, an outpouring of hope we have not seen in other surveys. Members dine here much more than at other clubs. When members eat out, it is not in search of better value or service. And this is a relatively young club with a good age profile. Probably uh, it's a plus or minus because we only capture it in five years. Here's what you need to participate as the leadership goes forward in fixing it. Food and beverage, the service timeliness problem must be addressed first. We may not actually have a menu and quality problem. All boats descend with the tide. Leadership at the board level. Well, the new board used this opportunity to open communications. And although I'm not here to tell you how to run things, there was a comment in here that I'm going to show you now, which I thought was apropos. I don't know how you elect people, but this person said, the animosity created by politics since we went to contested elections as the norm has an extremely negative impact on personal interactions in Stonebridge. Life was better when the board proposed three candidates and others could run if they wanted. I will add here, this is how we do it at Bears Ball. We have a committee of past presidents. It's a standing committee of the board. Uh, anyone who is currently on the board and a past president does not attend until he gets off the current board. But we select the nominating committee and we make sure that we have a good nominating committee that represents all of the people in the club. And the nominating committee then goes and looks preferably at those people who have been on operational committees to make sure that they can work with other people. And they pick, in our case, three candidates. Just for what it's worth, that's how we do it. The leadership, the general manager must become more visible, kind of like they say it was before he became general manager. <laughs> uh, he needs to be seen as operating like a COO, where he is in charge. There's always a concern in the people that the board is managing the thing and not letting the general manager manage. And that's frequently true. I mean, the losers are still up north. Only the winners got down here. We're all previously important people. And we're on the board. It's hard not to tell people how to run a shop, you know. We ran bigger shops than this. <laughs> anyway, he needs to be seen as uh, in charge, and he needs to start with food and beverage training. The office staff, same thing. They've got to be seen as effective and welcoming. Uh, so tidying up. There's an executive summary, which will be online for you to read. It's basically this in print. Descriptive statistics that will have how people voted on every single one of the 175 questions. How many people voted one, how many two, perhaps. So if you're the kind of person that wants to go in and see how they voted, it'll be in the library. You have all the data that we have. We'll have this presentation in PowerPoint. You can throw your own slides. We'll have a, apparently a video of this presentation. Now, I'm working right now on the renters uh, survey. and. Um, I will write up an executive uh, paper when I finish that, and that will be available to you in a few weeks from now. All of that will be available to you. We'll come back and train uh, a, a representative from Tim's shop in how to extract further information from the data in order to ask the kind of questions that the committees need at that lower level. 
But we are always available at no additional charge to come back at any time, talk to the board, train committees, 125,000 pieces of data. And as you can see from this morning, this was just high level stuff. None of the down, why did somebody do that? Who was it that did that? What could we do about it? All of that is untapped. Yet. And we'll create additional reports on requests. It came up in the meeting yesterday, how many people actually are here uh, all year? As Kim said, before I got here this morning, I said we ran it, it was 28%. So you can run these, re if you've got a true database, you can run these reports as fast as you can think up questions. So thanks for your attention, it's been a fun time. So we're going to have the first questions, if there are any. I have another wager. Jim suggests there may not be any questions because he was so thorough. Um, but also, it, because it is a town hall, after we get uh, the survey questions of, of Mr. MacArthur, if you have any other question, uh, be, please feel free to, to ask if this is your town hall meeting. So with that, if you have questions of, uh, of Jim, uh, please uh, use the microphone. We are, uh, as you know, we're taking this uh, meeting, so please use the microphone and, uh, and ask questions. Dale. Okay. Um, I was curious uh, to ask, Jim, if there was such a discrepancy between um, the satisfaction of the food and beverage, the dining room, and the amount of people who still come and eat here. Um, do you have any explanation for that? Uh, I think that um, the explanation is that they are part of a new day at Stonebridge. They're not anxious to, uh, to create difficulty by not eating in the brand new facility, but they sure want you to know, want this group to know that there are some problems that need to be fixed. No, I don't see a great uh, discord there. And I think, I really do think, that if you address the training issue, that uh, the tide will come up for all these other things. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, uh, my observation, just for what it's worth, also I think we're just a very social community. We prefer to come here to dine, where we see our friends and whatever, than to venture downtown to eat. You know, and I think that has to play a, a, a large part of it, too. It does. That, in fact, is the, is the primary and maybe only uh, tool you have in um, minimizing the loss uh, through the kitchen. You know, they say, well, look, you don't have to pay a tip to eat here, you don't have to pay parking. That's not enough. That's not enough. The social capital of being here is enough to keep people coming back here. If it's a nice place, if you've got the right ambiance. I guess my, my feeling is, is I think that administration and board should know that we're coming, not because we're getting great service, not because the food is fabulous, not because we all love the menus. We're coming because we support the club and we love it. We want it to get better. Yeah, I agree with you, but that's not gonna last forever. We need to fix things without doing it. See, I said no question. But I lost. I won the bet on the over 100 people, but I lost the bet on the questions. Um, any, Mr. Coco, you're going to make me lose this bet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting up to help you. No, I <laughs> now, what you should do, once you think this through, is bring forward questions that can be researched. And we'll research them, and the answers will get back to you. You don't have to 
ask it here. You may not even know quite yet how to ask some of these things. Think it to <coughs> your senior. Ask a question. Tim will give it to me. I'll research it, and uh, you'll have an answer. Um, Jim, explain if you can, and I think it's probably an easy explanation, when you said to us that 28% of Stonebridge residents live here year-round, is that extrapolated from the 732 responses you got, or is that an actual number? That is extrapolated. Okay. There are a certain number of people who voted that they live here nine plus months a year, which I take to be all year. Okay. Having got that number, I divide that by 48%, and that's the number of people in this population who probably live here all year. I assume, yeah, thank you. That's a fairly high number. 28, I guess not so high. So, um, well, thank Jim, and uh, thank uh, presentation. I'm sure we'll all have a lot of questions after we see the report and we look at the videotape. Uh, but now, this is a town hall meeting. If people have other questions they want to ask us, you're welcome to come up to the microphones and ask us. Identify yourself and ask us. That's what town halls are all about. Yeah. See you, Mark. Uh, the question that I have before he leaves, Jim. Uh, I saw the numbers. Uh, I've dealt with these numbers for uh, 42 years in the, uh, in the business of uh, advertising, marketing, and broadcasting. Uh, and the norm was that 20% of the people are paying 80% of the uh, business that comes and goes from an organization like ours. Uh, I see that number has risen a little bit to the 28%. Uh, my question then becomes, does the 28 or 30 percent that we see the people using the facilities more now because of a new facility going to be able to uh, afford the expenses that we have incurred at the 7.4 million dollars? Well, you should not look to me to answer that question. I have no idea. Uh, in fact, I think you're loading that. I'm well ready. Yeah, I oh, think you're, you're trying to get an answer that uh, there will be a problem paying that much money. I don't know the answer. Can you give a mic? Good here. Tony, one of, the, one of the things I'd share with you is that during the course of the renovation, there was at least 17 occasions where they addressed the operating costs as well. <coughs> And it was basically the question was, when we build this, then how much more is it going to cost us to operate it? And in some cases, the responses to those questions were more qualitative than quantitative. In some cases, we had quoted other clubs and what their experience was. In some cases, we said, well, this is going to probably cost us some more. This is going to probably, we can save some money because of efficiencies and so forth. We put together the budget for 2014, operating most of the year with, this, with a facility, or a lot of the year with a facility. And at the end of the year, we refunded money to the members because we had come in with, with better financial performance than we had expected. In 2015, we put together a budget for how this, how we felt this club would be run and what the cost would be for some of the new things. We had made estimates on utilities. We had done a lot of estimates for food and beverage. And through six months, we are, albeit <coughs> relatively small, we're $37,000, $40,000 favorable to that budget. So right now, I wouldn't say that there's any reason to believe that we're going to start seeing, can't, we can't prove this until we go through this budgeting process, but I don't think there's any valid reason right now to say that we're going to see costs escalating because we now have this facility. Great. Good answer. Does that answer the question?
question? Do we have any other questions for the town hall session? I think we're standing between you and lunch. <laughs> uh, if there are no other questions, then we'll close this town hall and thank you all for participating.